if there's any problem at all, um, people can type in the chat box and I should be able to see it at this end. I'll take questions preferably at the end um, as we go through. Now, this particular seminar is based on not on the day-to-day -day routine investigation of pulmonary embolism, which we all do, but on some of the facts or um, issues around pulmonary embolism that help the radiologist get an edge on a difficult diagnosis. In the majority of cases, the diagnosis um, is uh, one which is relatively straightforward and virtually all of us use CT pulmonary angiography. So just at the outset, I'm going to take a poll just now and then a poll at the end to see whether you've changed your opinion on, on this particular issue. But can I ask how many of you um, would consider using um, the perfusion lung scan today as part of your diagnostic armamentarium or is virtually everybody using CT pulmonary angiography? So um, yes, do you use the lung scan to sort out occasional problems? And no, you, you never use it. So if we could just ask that question just now, if you can vote, um, you'll see it on your screen. So everybody would consider, still consider using the, the perfusion lung scan. So that's good. And um, we'll come back to that and some of the issues related to that uh, at the end of the webinar. So if we go on to uh, the first slide, um, go down here. Um, as I said, uh, CT pulmonary angiography effectively is king at the moment for the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. And we can see emboli down to the fifth order vessels uh, within the pulmonary vasculature. But there are some issues where it's not clear cut. And about 10% of CTPAs are indeterminate for one reason or another, either for technical reasons or because of patient uh, related reasons, um, the, the scan is just simply not diagnostic. And in those cases, you need to have a bit of an edge to understand the clinical picture and to help you decide whether you're going to repeat the examination, do another examination, or, or wait a day or two and, and repeat the CTPA. So it's those um, core issues that uh, I'm going to uh, explore. So in this webinar, we're going to look at the natural history of pulmonary embolism. And these are all radiological or para-radiological slants on, on the whole thromboembolic process. So we'll look at the source of emboli, we'll look at its clinical characteristics, its radiological morphology, that's the morphology of the clots themselves, how fast they resolve, and then some of the issues round about pulmonary embolism um, that could be considered complications of pulmonary embolism, particularly pulmonary hypertension but also, and, and particularly, and a thing that interests me is the hemodynamic compromise that pulmonary embolism causes and how we as radiologists can identify and quantify that. And then to look at some of the facts in fiction round about pulmonary infarction. So um, emboli, the majority of emboli come from the lower limbs. Now, again, there's, there's an issue of a sort of belief that upper limb emboli, SVC emboli, are significant. But in fact, um, the vast majority of emboli arise from the lower limbs. I was going to ask a, a question at this point of what percentage um, of emboli um, come from the upper limb. Um, but you can see it's, uh, there's no need to take part in this particular poll. Yeah, I've, I've shown you the, the two slides that the majority of, uh, of emboli actually come from the IVC, the eye-like vessels, or the femoral veins. Um, and that although upper limb thrombi are relatively common in clinical practice, in terms of causing hemodynamically significant emboli, um, almost none uh, uh, arise from the upper limbs. There is, however, um, an interesting um, uh, niche fact around the source of emboli, and that is around the right ventricle as a source of embolism. And you can see in this slide that um, a large number of autopsies were done. This is a Swedish study from 2005, 
looked at the presence of emboli or clot, which could be said to be originating from the right ventricle. Um, and these are patients who have suffered either myocardial infarction or chronic heart failure who have formed emboli within the right heart that's been large enough to cause a significant, um, hemodynamically significant uh, thromboembolic episode. And in fact, they found that of uh, all these patients dying with pulmonary embolism of 220 patients, 4% had right heart thrombus as the only detectable source of emboli at, at post-mortem. And if you, I mean, I, I simply didn't believe this. And then I actually started looking for right ventricular thrombi on CTPA. And lo and behold, I'd only been looking for it for about a couple of months. And sure enough, I found the first one. Um, and the figure of right ventricular uh, thrombi de novo causing pulmonary embolism lies around about 2 to 4%. So when you're doing your CT pulmonary angiogram, always look carefully uh, at the right ventricle, just in case um, you can find that there's a large clot still to, to, still to come from the apex of the RV. So that's just a, a small print niche um, fact about the source of emboli. Also, unsuspected emboli, if you randomly um, CT all patients uh, who have got cancer, you're going to find um, that a fair proportion of these patients have got silent thromboembolic disease. Um, and in this study um, from 2005, Storter found that about 5% of all patients who have a CT of the thorax and um, for other reasons, unsuspecting pulmonary embolism, um, have got significant thromboembolic disease. And you can see that um, of these patients, five of the incidental emboli were in the main pulmonary artery, five were in the lobar, and nine were at a segmental level. So these are not tiny subsegmental emboli. These are these are significant sized emboli. So in a study that we did at Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, we found that six percent of patients had significant sized thrombi. And 35% of these were lower or greater. And about one in three of them had been missed on the first review of the, uh, of the uh, CT pulmonary angiogram. Next slide. Now, clinical presentation. Um, I'm going to uh, ask another clinical question here, and you'll see it come up. Um, the median duration is about how long it takes from the start of a patient's onset of symptoms until they present for the CT pulmonary angiogram. There's a bit of a misconception that massive pulmonary embolism presents right away with collapse. Um, so I'm going to ask you, the median duration of symptoms for massive PE um, is three, 30 minutes, three hours, or three days. At the moment, we've just got a single vote. Just wait until everyone votes. That's fine. Well, you can see that the majority of people are suspecting that the emboli have a delayed presentation. That is absolutely correct. Our clinical colleagues tend to have this misconception that embolic disease presents instantly, you know, within minutes or hours of the actual event. So um, if we take um, the Pyoped study, which looked, which did have an element of the duration of symptoms in it, uh, the Pyoped 2 study, which used CT pulmonary angiography and CT venography, they had 824 patients in the study. 23%, about a quarter of the patients, were positive for thromboembolic disease. Um, Presenting symptoms had 8% circulatory collapse, about one in three had uncomplicated dyspnea, and about 40% had hemoptysis or pleuritic chest pain. I find that figure slightly unusual, but I'll come back to that in a second. Um, less than a third had any symptoms at all in their legs. And dyspnea was present at rest in about 49% of patients. So that's actually quite a high number of percent 
just with dyspnea. Um, and of that group, 23% had orthopnea and 14% had exertional dyspnea only, which I think is actually uh, relatively small. But we did a study to look at the presentation of the clinical presentation of massive pulmonary embolism. That was pulmonary embolism that was deemed to be maximum size on our scoring system. And I'll talk a bit more about scoring systems in a minute. We use the modified Miller score that Banke and his colleagues uh, developed in Switzerland. And uh, 16 out of 16 is maximum thromboembolic load. So we looked at 54 patients who had what you would term radiologically massive pulmonary embolism. And in that group, 80% had dyspnea as the cardinal feature. Um, only less than a quarter had any pleuritic type symptoms at all. And a tiny amount, less than 5%, had hemoptysis. So the pleurisy hemoptysis presentation was, was relatively small. And the, the vast majority of these large emboli presented as, as breathlessness, alone unexplained breathlessness. And about 15% had hypotension as a clinical feature, that is, of, of impending circulatory collapse. But what we found um, interesting was that almost a third of patients had had symptoms going back at least seven days. So massive or submassive thromboembolic disease need not present as a catastrophic instantaneous phenomenon. So as a radiologist, you need to be alert to those patients who have got unexplained dyspnea, whether they're coming from primary care or secondary care. But unexplained dyspnea and a relatively normal chest x-ray is a worrying feature and always makes me highly suspicious of thromboembolic disease, irrespective of how long the symptoms have been going on for. Which leads me on to the other silent killer, if you like, and that's chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. And if you look at all patients who are diagnosed with chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, studies have shown that a fair proportion of those, this one, which appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2004, shows that over half of the patients with definite proven thromboembolic disease, the initial thromboembolic event was never even recognized, not by the clinicians or the patient. There was no index event. So something clearly um, is operating here with major thromboembolic disease that can behave as a relatively silent event. And then only the sequelae that is right heart failure or, or the breathlessness from obstructed pulmonary arteries um, leads to the presenting um, uh, scenario. So one of the other myths that that generates is this phenomenon. Well, if, if thromboembolic disease is silent, could it actually just be the lungs slowly silting up or sludging up with multiple tiny um, emboli? Or is it a single large event that doesn't, uh, that doesn't um, resolve? So effectively, um, I've displayed it as, are you looking at lots of little meteors? Or are you looking at one huge asteroid that hits the pulmonary arteries and then um, doesn't resolve? Well. An answer to that you may be able to derive from looking at thrombus morphology. If you cast your mind back to all the thromboembolic disease that you've seen in the last year or two years, I would bet that your experience is exactly the same as mine, that the vast majority are large segments of thrombus. And that's not just because we only see large segments of thrombus, it's because that the emboli themselves tend to behave um, as a large solid clump of thrombus rather than tiny little fragments breaking off. And here we've got, in these three scans, you can see effectively what is the casts of the leg veins appearing doubled up, folded backwards and forwards in the pulmonary arteries across the bifurcation here of the main pulmonary artery. And this is so-called saddle emboli. And this is, this is what it looks like pathologically. Here is the, this is a patient who had um, experienced breathlessness after an episode of air travel, and then had been erroneously diagnosed as having influenza. Uh, 
and had been at home in bed for four or five days, becoming progressively more breathless and was then admitted to intensive care where she rapidly succumbed to right heart failure. And at post-mortem, surprise, surprise, she'd, she'd flown from Australia. Um, it had been a 23 hour flight. Um, and this was about a week after the flight. And the poor lady succumbed. And this is um, the post-mortem. This is the right pulmonary artery here. This is the left pulmonary artery. And you can see here a cast of the leg veins doubled over. This was two and a half feet long, this thing when it was unfolded. And you can actually see casts of the valves. So what you're looking at here is an event which took place um, some days before. The, the thrombus is almost like leather. Um, took place some days before. And the patient had been suffering effectively from chronic right heart failure or acute on chronic right heart failure over the course of four or five days um, and only just managing to compensate and undiagnosed and untreated and the right heart eventually gave out. So this represents the sort of picture that you get with a lot of major massive pulmonary embolism. You can see here, here's an old fashioned venogram showing um, one of the casts of these long um, thrombi here in the, uh, in the femoral vein. And these are the things that cause, that cause the damage. So these long casts, though, don't always remain stable. And the right ventricle is capable, the right ventricle and the tricuspid valve are capable of chopping this up into segments and distributing these segments to the right and left pulmonary arteries. So here you can see segments here in the right and left pulmonary arteries in all these scans and with some saddle thrombus still there. So, and you can see here that it's all bunched up into a solid uh, lump on this side. So these almost spaghetti-like emboli can get chopped up. Now I've got a video here. So if you all click um, on this video, if you take your cursors and click on the video, you'll see here um, an echocardiogram of thrombus coming into the right ventricle. And you can see the right ventricle slightly dilated. I'll talk more about that in a minute and how you can measure that. And you can see the thrombus being mashed up like a washing machine inside the RV um, and being distributed into the main pulmonary artery. So this phenomenon of right ventricular, um, almost a sort of right ventricular washing machine uh, is, is relatively common. And it's one of the reasons why patients get atrial fibrillation. The right ventricle is relatively sensitive. Any of you who have done right heart catheterization or swan gans catheters will know that the minute you put a catheter into the right ventricle, you shower off all sorts of arrhythmias. And then if you're in the right atrium, um, it, you can induce atrial fibrillation. So that's why these clots, as they spin around um, inside the right heart, can induce uh, various arrhythmias. Um, the next stage, the next stage up, if you like, from the long casts of the iliofemoral segments are the IVC thrombi. And it's possible, entirely possible, for the IVC to become thrombosed, particularly in uh, cancer and in, in lymphoma, uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Um, all the things that will cause localized problems within the abdomen uh, can cause IVC thrombus. And these casts, the casts from the IVC, can be huge. And in a lot of cases, they just completely obstruct the right heart and, and sudden death or sudden right ventricular failure ensues. But not always. And some of these larger thrombi can get through into the, uh, into the pulmonary circulation and, and block off one or other or partially both of the main central pulmonary arteries. So these, the, the thrombus morphology here is again telling us that it's big emboli that come in um, and don't subsequently get lies that cause thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. Um, eventually, these large ones, if they don't become um, lysed by the natural lysis system, will become endothelialized and they form these sort of almost limpet um, uh, structures. You can see one here um, in the right main pulmonary artery 
and you can see another one here in the left main pulmonary artery. And these are characteristic of chronic emboli that have taken place weeks, months, or um, probably months or even years before, and have become incorporated into the wall of the main pulmonary artery. And then finally, the feared but much less common subsegmental emboli. These, we, we worry about missing these radiologically. We worry about how to treat them clinically. But in fact, these only represent a tiny proportion. That is, people with isolated tiny emboli only represent a tiny proportion of all patients. Here, uh, about 6% in the PIPED study. Um, so they, are, they do happen, but they're much less common than the large emboli that, that do not um, subsequently lie. And if you look at the material that is taken out of the pulmonary arteries at surgery, and the upper uh, slide here shows fresh clot. These are emboli from the legs that have been taken out in an acute um, pulmonary embolectomy by a surgeon. But by the time a patient gets round to having chronic thrombombolic pulmonary hypertension and a patient has a thromboendarterectomy, the material that comes out looks very different. It's fibrinous, it's endothelialized, it's lost its, um, its, its fresh thrombus uh, content, and it's much more tenacious stuff uh, to get out. And that's why they have to core out the, uh, the pulmonary arteries when they do um, thromboendarterectomy for chronic thromboembolism. So we're looking at, in these two cases, we're, we're looking anatomically and pathologically at two separate uh, um, processes. So um, that leads me on now to uh, radiological assessment of pulmonary embolism severity. Now, clearly, um, the uh, pulmonary embolism uh, size will have a different effect on the right heart. Um, and it will also have an effect on pulmonary perfusion, obviously. And so there is almost a, a linear um, association between how much thrombus you can pour into the pulmonary circulation and the effect on, uh, on oxygen saturation. But it's estimated that you require to have more than 50% of the pulmonary vascular bed occluded to start presenting with um, either hypoxia or hypertension or significant cardiac side effects. So if you've got a patient that, that is pitched to you, as does this patient of pulmonary embolism, um, because they've got a low blood pressure or a tachycardia or a profound hypoxia, then if it is going to be embolic disease that's causing it, it's going to be a big one. You're not looking for tiny emboli in these patients. By definition, from the pathophysiology, you must be looking for and must be trying to find large emboli. And even if you find a tiny little incidental embolus, that's not the cause of the patient's symptoms, because tiny emboli simply don't give you the hemodynamic and, and physiological compromise um, that's sometimes suspected. So I'm going to look at two elements here. We're going to look at the thrombus load, and I'm going to look at the cardiovascular parameters. So why bother doing this? What's the point? Um, why bother measuring thrombus load and, and so on? Well, first of all, it gives you a baseline in the events that this patient will have, um, and allows you to monitor the prognosis and should hopefully help you decide on therapy. Obviously, the more massive an embolus, you have to be more alert to the um, outcome, the complications of, of large emboli. And also, it may sway you to decide or may sway the clinician to decide when to give thrombolysis uh, for patients who have massive PE. And finally, if you're doing any research at all in thromboembolic disease, you're going to have to have a way of quantifying thrombi. So, Go on to the next slide. Um, we've known that hemodynamic compromise from thrombobodies, that is acute right heart dysfunction, um, leads to this golden hour. Um, the same thing that they talk about, the golden hour of trauma and so on. 
there's a golden hour and thromboembolic disease where the patient presents to you um, and is at that point hemodynamically unstable and you have to decide at that point whether you're going to how you're going to investigate the patient and how you're going to report your study and what emphasis you're going to put in your radiological report um, and how that interacts with the clinical um, decision making whether the patient gets thrombolysis or not so if we look at thrombus load first of all um, there are a number of scoring systems and they're eponymous that usually attach the patient the, the um, clinician's name that, that um, invented or discovered the, the system but the one that we use is probably the oldest and it's an angiographic scoring system it was originally ident um, developed for um, thrombolysis uh, studies um, way back in the 1970s and they had an 18 uh, point score for the 18 pulmonary segments um, and it was obstruction weighted um, that's called the Miller score it's named after Miller the cardiologist that, that uh, led the th pulmonary thrombolysis study you often find that cardiologists are mixed up in in this uh, in the business of thromboembolic disease because in the old days they were the ones who did the, the uh, conventional pulmonary angiograms but now the diagnosis is almost exclusively um, led by radiologists. We've also got the Walsh score, which was an angiographic score, um, and the Mastora score. Now, the reason that I have adopted the Miller score is that um, Banke and his colleagues in 1997 adapted it for CT pulmonary angiography, and they developed a 16 point score. They missed out the apical segments of of both lower lobes um, because it was quite difficult to see on the early CT scans and what they did was they um, gave no um, they weren't concerned about whether it was total occlusion or partial occlusion of the pulmonary artery there just had to be thrombus in the pulmonary artery so there was six maximum score of 16 nine on the right seven on the left and it wasn't obstruction weighted and we've continued to use that because we've found that a lot of the other scoring systems are so complicated to use and time consuming that you can't get radiologists or clinicians to either understand them or use them properly. So we've stuck with the Miller score and we've found it very useful. Um, but you, you're welcome to use whatever scoring system you're comfortable with. But that's the one that we use and we've used for our research. Um, we found it reproducible, it's useful for clinical um, communication, and we know that high scores are associated with right ventricular dilatation and subsequent clinical instability. And there's up to, the, if you take the maximum score of 16, up to the score of 12 out of 16, the right ventricle barely dilates. 12 and 16, the right ventricle really starts to, to increase in volume. Some examples of that in a second. So that leads on to the cardiovascular parameters that we can see on CT pulmonary angiography. Now, a lot of the work that we've done on this has derived from some work that was done on echocardiography. So I'm going to show you some echocardiograms um, and some CT pulmonary angiograms, and you'll see the similarities between uh, the, the views and so on that we're, we're looking at. So. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to have to speed up a wee bit. Uh, been asked to increase, so I'll just move a bit faster. Um, so here we go. Here's a right ventricle that's dilated, um, and on the echocardiogram, you can see the dilated RV here, and on the corresponding CT pulmonary angiogram, there's the dilated uh, right ventricle here, and you can see this D-shaped left ventricle. Now, normally the left ventricle in short axis. Is circular, but on both on the echo and on the CT pulmonary angiogram, you can see that the septum shifts over into the LV. So here we go. Um, if you use your pointer again here and click on this, this is a, a view, uh, a four chamber view echocardiogram, and you can see that the right ventricle is dilated and the left ventricle here is compromised and this is why the blood pressure drops 
the patient has got autotamponade occurring within the heart, within the fixed bag of the pericardium. And you can see that the RV takes up more space because it's becoming dilated with the back pressure from the obstructed pulmonary arteries. And this is it in schematic. Um, you can see here that we have the uh, increasing pulmonary artery pressure, increasing uh, afterload. And as the afterload increases, the RV dilates, the LV output goes down, and the patient becomes progressively ischemic. And then it's a cycle um, to uh, ventricular failure and, and sudden cardiac uh, standstill. So um, this is what the normal um, RV-LV ratio should look like. The LV just marginally larger in uh, short axis. It doesn't matter whether it's in systole or diastole. You don't need to ECG gate your CT pulmonary angiogram. You're going to see this phenomenon. And in fact, the bigger the embolus, the worse the cardiac function is and the easier it is to see. Um, now, that's, this is the normal ratio. And this is a slide of what the abnormal um, RV looks like. You can see the dilatation here. You can see the speculation within it. And you can see the compromised LV. And the septum shifts uh, towards the left. And that's why you get axis deviation on your, um, on your ECG, because literally the cardiac axis does shift. And here's a number of patients all exhibiting this right ventricular dilatation phenomenon with compromise or compression of the left ventricle. Um, and you can measure the short axis, the maximum short axis dimension. And if the ratio is greater than, of RV to LV is greater than one, then you have right ventricular dilatation. And when it's there, it's obvious. And you can see here's another group of patients with this same phenomenon. All of these patients had large thromboembolic loads. And here's a classic case. This patient came in as an orthopedic case with uh, DVT arising from uh, a cast uh, of the leg veins. The patient had a fractured femur um, and presented with massive pulmonary embolism and received thrombolysis. And 24 hours after thrombolysis, the RVLV ratio has normalized. And that's the phenomenon. That's the effect that thrombolysis brings about. It, it virtually doesn't clear any of the thrombi from the peripheries of the lung. It simply creates enough space round about them to offload the, uh, the pressure on the right ventricle. And you can see that the pressure normalizes and the RV normalizes very quickly. We've known that the mortality rate um, from pulmonary embolism is increased if the patient has signs of RV dysfunction at presentation. And so um, that's a thing to always look out for. Um, and cardiac parameters have been known by cardiologists for a long time to be a predictor of mortality. And you can see here in this study that as the RVLV ratio increased um, here, you can see that the mortality um, gradually increased as well. And that's been borne out in a number of studies. Effectively, if the RV is occluded, uh, is, is dilated uh, because of pulmonary artery obstruction, then the patient is more likely to suffer an in-house episode, an in-hospital episode of, of sudden cardiac arrest. Um, and that's why biomarkers go up as well, because as the RV is stretched, the troponin and all the other biomarkers from the, from the right ventricle rise. And it's been known for some time now that uh, elevated troponin um, from mass, in the scenario of massive pulmonary embolism is a bad sign. Another small print issue to do with uh, offloading the right ventricle is patent foramen ovale. Now, a significant number of normal individuals have got a patent foramen ovale, and it doesn't matter in normal life. It doesn't really matter because the PFO is closed because the right heart pressures are not high enough to, to open up the patent foramen. But in this study, um, from 1998, it was shown that of cases who were dying from thromboembolic disease, an abnormally high number of them had a PFO. And this led people to think, well, the PFO must be having some effect on the hemodynamics of thromboembolic disease. 
And we all wittingly or unwittingly have seen this phenomenon when we've been doing CT pulmonary angiograms. And we've seen that um, you can find non-contrast enhanced pulmonary arteries um, before the, the uh, sorry, after the uh, contrast has actually hit the systemic vessels. So somehow in your CT pulmonary angiogram, contrast is bypassing the pulmonary circulation. And it's been found that patients who do a Muller um, when they're taking a breath in at the time of their CT pulmonary angiogram can actually open up their PFO and the contrast will go through from right heart to left heart and bypass the lungs. So effectively, um, it acts as a conduit from the right heart circulation to the left heart circulation. And that, not surprisingly, can lead to the phenomenon of emboli getting across the PFO. So here we go. Here's a, a CT, sorry, it is an echo, um, showing the two atria here. And this large segment of thrombus stuck going across uh, what is effectively a patent foramen of It could be an ASD, but this is, this is a, a PFO. And in this case, if you click on the if you click on the video with your finger, you will actually see um, the worm-like thrombus stuck across uh, the PFO, the patent frame of failure in this individual. Um, and the you can see the worm-like structure. This is the atrial septum here, interatrial septum. And again, you can see the tortuous um, behaviour of this piece of thrombus just trying to break off. And some years ago, we published this particular case in the British Journal of Radiology. This was a patient, uh, this was before the days of the very high resolution multiplanar reconstructions. So you have to, sorry, just, excuse me a second. Hello? Sorry, I beg your pardon about that. Um, what, we're, what we're looking at here is a thrombus um, lying in the left subclavian. Sorry, let me just switch this phone off. Here we go. Um, you can see thrombus here extending from the left subclavian down into the descending aorta. And this is a patient who had suffered a massive pulmonary embolism. And you can see clot in the aorta here and clot in the pulmonary arteries. So the right ventricle had dilated, the right atrium had opened up, thrombus had gone through the interatrial septum and gone through into the systemic circulation and lodged in the left subclavian and hanging down as a cast of the leg veins down into the descending aorta. A rather unusual, an unusual case. So we're now moving on swiftly to uh, the resolution rate of pulmonary emboli. Here's a nice slide that shows you that they can resolve very, very quickly. Here's a patient that just had two weeks of heparin and warfarin, and these clots have disappeared. But we know from uh, longitudinal studies that a fair proportion of patients will have significant thromboembolic residue in their pulmonary circulation up to a year after the event. And this landmark paper by Remy Jardin from Lille showed that over half of patients who had had a central, a massive pulmonary embolism, had residual thromboembolic material in the pulmonary arteries a year after um, the, the initial event. And you can see that about 10% of the patients went on to have clinically proven thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. So the, the message here is big emboli, more likely to not resolve completely. And when that happens, you're more likely to get thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension which can, as you know, be a chronic disabling catastrophe for the patient. But it's a bit of a mixed bag looking at the figures of the various studies. We're not really comparing apples with apples. And you can see here in this uh, series that 13% had cleared at eight days and 48% had cleared at 12 months. So still about 12, about 50% showing some sort of um, material at 12 months and about 5% developing pulmonary hypertension. So you just have to be alert to that particular group. 
almost as a counter to that, Stein published this one that showed 40% had dissolved at seven days and 80% at 28 days. From my own personal experience, that I have not been able to reproduce this. And my personal experience is more towards the significant numbers between 30 and 50% having material left at anything up to, to six months. But um, you're, everybody's going to have a slightly different um, slant on that, depending on what your patient population is, what the pre prevalence of cancer and so on is. So um, if you look at the Q-scan and how the, the perfusion scintigram allows you to look at this, it's actually much more sensitive than the CT pulmonary angiogram for finding chronic, chronic defects. And you can see here um, in one of these studies that a third of patients had uh, defects at 90 days and another had a, a third of patients had persistent defects at 180 days. So again, relatively significant numbers. Now, the new multi-slice scanners, you know, the, the 320 slice scanners are allowing us to do CT pulmonary perfusion scans, which in effect are, um, are the equivalent of three-dimensional um, radioisotope perfusion lung scans. And here you can see a perfusion defect um, here uh, in the right lung. And this uh, perfusion scan this is done at Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. Um, and another one here, large perfusion defect here. And this is a useful way of looking at the dynamics of pulmonary perfusion by doing volume scanning using a multi detector array um, CT pulmonary angiography. And this is a coronal reconstruction of someone um, so that the, all of the lungs are actually in the scan volume. And you can see that there's chronic hypoperfusion here uh, of the right lung. And one of the things that's led us to look at is to compare areas of the lung that have different perfusion rates. Um, and you can see that there are sections of lung which perfuse normally and sections of lung which show delayed uh, perfusion. And this sort of phenomenon of stunned lung where you've got thromboembolic disease that hasn't properly lysed and leaves areas of chronic hypoperfusion. So there's lots of research, um, I think, waiting to be done now, um, looking at uh, regional pulmonary uh, perfusion. And just to go back to the figures of patients developing thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, uh, Remy Jardin suggested that about 8% developed thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, but the figures vary depending on how you look for it um, and how you, um, what basis that you judge the patient's symptoms. Um, and I mentioned earlier, over a half of these patients, the, the index event, the cardinal event, has, was not recognized at the time. So you have to be alert, you have to be on your toes as a radiologist to pick up these patients who are being investigated for breathlessness for other reasons. And you need to be looking for thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. Now I'm just going to say a few quick words about pulmonary infarction. What is it? Is it hemorrhage? Is it true lung death? Is it a scar? Um, well, I tend to call it um, thromboembolic related consolidation. Because in a lot of cases, it's not true um, dead lung, um, and nor is it true hemorrhage. It seems to be a, a focally edematous section of lung. And here's a nice example of a pulmonary infarct developing on a chest X-ray. You can see here the Hampton's hump starting to develop. And by day 10, you can see there's a nice wedge-shaped area of consolidation there that's, that's an exemplar of this phenomenon. Here it is on CT pulmonary angiography. It comes in various sizes, but they tend to be plural-based. They tend to be wedge-shaped, but through time, they become more spherical. And that's one of the things that you need to be on the lookout for. And um, that and this phenomenon, I've called it um, jokingly the crunchy bar sign because it looks a bit like a crunchy bar. You can see the aerated center of the crunchy bar. Uh, forgive me, any of you who do not know what crunchy bar is, but they're rather nice. So look out for one in the shops. But when you cut into a crunchy bar, you're left with this lower density center. And that's characteristic of pulmonary infarcts. And you can see the same phenomenon here. Here's another one here. And here's one here with these sort of air densities within it. Now, these are not necrotic bits of lung. 
Well, these are, are areas of re-aeration of, uh, of edematous or hemorrhagic lung. This is a nice example showing how emboli um, become infarcts and subsequently become pulmonary nodules because this patient had had multiple emboli proven on CT pulmonary angiography. And here, initially, it's ground glass. Here, it's starting to become a crunchy bar. And then subsequently, some months later, two months later, it's a nodule. And here is another one here. Looks like a nodule. The nodule starting to get smaller. So a lot of these tiny peripheral nodules that we see that resolve are in fact not pulmonary nodules, but they are slowly resolving pulmonary infarcts. Um, so they go from this ground glass hazy appearance to a crunchy bar to a nodule and then uh, slowly involute to, to a scar. Some of them are particularly large. Here's one that is associated with necrotic lung. And if the embolus is big enough, um, it can cause quite a bit of dead lung and, and can subsequently develop an abscess. And that, of course, is quite different from the appearance that you get from a pneumonia. This is a, a left lobe of pneumonia. And you can see clearly this homogeneous, dense, plural-based consolidation. So what's the future of the Q-scan? Well, for some time now, the Q-scan has been said to be obsolete. But have we thrown uh, the baby out completely with the bath water? We know that it's highly sensitive. It's got a very high negative predictive value. It reduces the radiation dose considerably. And this is um, important for pregnant patients and young females where the breast is radiosensitive. Um, and it's certainly safe in terms of patients who have had anaphylaxis to contrast. And finally, it's much more sensitive for the diagnosis of thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. Um, the Royal College of Gynecologists have suggested that the patient has a chest X-ray, a Doppler of the legs, and then a CTPA or a Q-scan. And locally, we've adopted a half-dose perfusion lung scan as long as the chest X-ray is negative. And of course, in the vast majority of your pregnant patients, the lungs are going to be negative. Um, if the lungs, uh, the chest X-ray, sorry, is going to be negative. If the chest X-ray shows a lot of consolidation and pleural fluid, you're better to go on with the CT pulmonary angiogram because you'll get a more definitive answer. But in the majority of patients that you investigate, they're going to have a negative chest X-ray. Um, and you can see here a considerably reduced dose um, from the Q-scan as opposed to the CTPA. And these are the um, predicted lifetime risk values for a radiation dose to the breast. Now, of course, the radiation dose from CT pulmonary angiography is coming down all the time. But nonetheless, um, it's probably still safer in terms of long-term outcome for the female and the mother um, to, to use a Q-scan. Um, also, as I mentioned already, the CTPA uh, diagnosis of chronic thrombopulmonary chronic, chronic thrombopulmonary pulmonary hypertension is not as sensitive as that of the Q-scan. And if you, if you compare the two, um, Q-scan is about 90, greater than 95% sensitivity for picking up thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, and CTPA only about 50%. So if you've got someone who's breathless, who's got big pulmonary arteries, you're not sure whether they've got endoluminal um, endothelialized thrombus or not, if you're trying to differentiate those from the patients who have got primary pulmonary hypertension or secondary pulmonary hypertension from left heart failure, then do radioisotope perfusion scintigram because you will be able to pick up those cases that have got clear-cut defects for the, from their thromboembolic disease because if it's that that's the cause of their pulmonary hypertension, um, you will certainly see it on the Q-scan. So conclusions from this webinar. I'm sorry to have hurried it a wee bit towards the end, but we were um, running out of time. Pulmonary embolism and chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension are commoner than we think. Large pulmonary emboli are also commoner than we think, and they may have a delayed presentation or indeed might not even clinically present at the initial episode at all, as I've shown you. Emboli are larger than we think, and they resolve more slowly than we usually think, and they also resolve 
more incompletely uh, than we think. And to help get a handle on this, to help radiologists get a handle of this, look um, not just at thrombus loading uh, element of your interpretation of the scan, but also look at the hemodynamic compromise. And a standardized scoring system of thromboembolic disease is going to be useful to communicate with your clinical colleagues. And also, don't forget the poor old perfusion lung scan. It should always be there in the background to help you sort out some of those difficult cases. So thank you very much for uh, that. And <laughs> I asked at the start how many of you would use the perfusion lung scan. And you all said yes. And I would guess you're probably all going to say yes again. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. So anyway, thank you very much. If there are any questions anyone has, um, I would be happy to, to take them on the chat. Um, and good luck with your thromboembolic diagnosis. Nope. No questions. Great. Just in case anybody's thinking on any questions and not typed them up, um, just very briefly. Um, not as a joke, but as a serious issue. Um, patients who die while on the toilet, um, again, is another one of these little small print things about thromboembolic disease. And it's often been argued in the past that that's due to patients dislodging thrombus while straining. But in fact, it's now thought it's because that a lot of these patients are in knife edge right ventricular failure. It doesn't take much strain at all to actually cause complete right ventricular uh, collapse. So it's unlikely that they've fired off another thrombus. Um, it's more likely that they've in fact pushed themselves over the edge. Uh, I've got one question coming in from Nick Bennett. Um, what are my thoughts on ventilation scanning in addition to perfusion scanning? I think. For practical terms, I mean, uh, we used to do ventilation perfusion, ventilation scans all the time, but it was really helpful in those days when we did not have recourse to CT pulmonary angiography and we had to try and differentiate what consolidation actually meant. Did consolidation mean that there was a ventilation defect there and could the ventilation defect be matched with the abnormality seen on the chest X-ray? Now that we've got recourse to CT pulmonary angiography, we almost never do it um, at all. And that's for practical and um, mundane reasons more than anything else. So I would, I would suggest that really, if you've got access just to perfusion scanning, you, know, you don't need uh, ventilation scanning. Thank you. No other questions? Well, thank you all very much. And I hope you enjoyed that. If I... Oh, sorry, got someone else. Nope, that's great. Thank you. And thank you all for participating. And I uh, look forward to seeing others in the BIR. Um, seminars in 